Uh, day one of the Science Forum South Africa hosted at the CSIR International Convention Center in Pretoria. The forum serves as a public platform for debating the science and society interface. Higher Education Minister Bladen Zimande is was actually giving an address and this was an opening address. For the latest, we now cross to Liesl Wilson who is at the Convention Center in Pretoria. Well, Liesl, we of course heard from the Higher Education Minister. Just talk to us about some of the key things that he said during his opening address. Onati, good afternoon. I'm struggling to hear you. I'm just going to pick up, um, pick up rather from where we left off a little earlier on. As you did indicate, we are coming to you live from the CSIR ICC in Pretoria. This is where the Science um, Forum for South Africa 2023 is happening. So we obviously heard the address from um, Dr. Bladen Zimandes, the Minister of Higher Education, Science and Innovation. We're looking at the role that science is playing. Africa, extended to the continent and even globally, how it touches into various aspects of society, looking at the energy crisis, looking at climate change, looking at health and food security, also looking at the role that partnerships and collaborations can play. I must say, after we spoke to you a little earlier on, we were interacting with some of the exhibitionists that are um, you know, out here to display some of their innovations and really promote Brand South Africa. Universities have come out to showcase what their research is also going to entail and look like. We've also heard about the role of nuclear um, amongst many other things. So as indicated earlier on, there's about 60 um, plenary sessions that's going to be happening between the 6th and the 8th of December. So there's lots to unpack on different fronts. But to take the conversation forward and keep it going, I'm now going to be joined by Dr. Mnungisi Tele. He's the CEO of the National Advisory Council on Innovation. And we're just going to be in conversation about the BRICS um, science and Technology Innovation Policy Symposium that had been taking place and really waited from here. So on that note, let me welcome Dr. Mnungi Sikele into this conversation and um, thank you for your time with us here on the ACBC at this hour. We're looking at BRICS, so the role that um, BRICS countries and BRICS nations can play, obviously on the back of the uh, 15th BRICS Summit that was held in August this year. Walk us through some of the perspectives that BRICS nations hold in relation to science, technology and innovation. And what's coming through on a policy front? Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity that we are given. Of course, BRICS, as you can imagine now, uh, with the BRICS Plus coming into being at a broad macroeconomic level, they hold a bigger promise. But from the scientific and technological point of view as well, it's going to be a huge platform for South Africa to tap into and to leverage. So in the conversations that we had in the last two days, firstly, we had to explore different policies that were being implemented across BRICS countries in terms of the extent to which they meet the needs of the majority, but also how they respond to the period of crisis and conflict and the need to better enhance international coordination and cooperation. But also for South Africa, we had to learn about how other BRICS countries have increased their level of investment in research and development, which is the biggest challenge that we are confronting with. But most importantly, how we need to be bringing citizens uh, to be part of the process, evolving new ways of uh, doing science how do we then reimagine and structure uh, STI policies? But we also looked into the future because that was the essence of what we wanted to look at. We took um, a 2050 a, a, you know, focus to then say, if we imagine ourselves in 2050, how will the world look like and what type of interventions do we need to identify and set in place and how do we respond? to emerging technologies like generative artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, and what type of promises and risks that these emerging technologies do have, and how do we therefore create the necessary governance frameworks, which must be underpinned by democratic values, so that we are able to respond to societal challenges, and in particular to the global uh, challenges, for instance, climate change, water security, food security, which, which are really confronting not only South Africa but the global communities. So these are some of the issues that we're grappling with in the last two days. But we also agreed 
that uh, we need to build the next layer of policy analysts so that uh, they can be able to take over. Africa offers a, you know, a digi what we call a dividend, you know, because it's a youthful continent which other BRICS countries um, can benefit from us as well. No, absolutely. You touched on some pertinent points. Um, we're looking at food security, there's the use of nuclear, there's the um, climate change that's also happening, even a post-COVID reality on the continent the opportunities that also exist. But how does collaboration amongst BRICS nations also come to the fore in terms of training, skills development, research sharing? What, what was discussed on that front? You see, firstly, what was important was for, for us to agree that we need to have a new working group on science, technology, innovation, policy, and foresight. You know, in other words, create a platform through which all BRICS countries can sit around the table and share knowledge and experiences about their different STI activities and how do we then structure um, the initiatives to respond to the pressing challenges of our society. So that was key in terms of, of, uh, of, of the forum that we, we hosted. But secondly, there are platforms that are existing. Others uh, will have to be explored in terms of uh, staff and student exchanges that do exist to scale up because certainly we need to scale up and you know and, and make sure that we leverage as South Africa you know the opportunities that BRICS provide for us to respond to the challenges that that do exist so again you correctly you correct in terms of saying COVID offered us huge opportunities to learn both in terms of how we need to do things differently yes. and the things that we shouldn't be doing because they didn't help us during the COVID period. Um, so, so that was part of the conversation to say, how do we prepare our systems to respond to future pandemics and other trajectories that may, may happen uh, in, in the future? Well, a thorough analysis uh, needs to also look at the gaps that still exist. Well, what emerged on that front just during the discussions as we speak? Look, for instance, um, here in South Africa, one of the examples, the challenges that we are, we are confronting uh, from the STI point of view is the level of investment in, in science and technology, which is below the 1.5% target that we have had. The president is going to be on Tuesday, he's going to be here. So this is going to feature prominently, and the minister did deteriorate that point. Actually, we, we, we are calling for business to improve. Um, the, the, the commitment and the level of investment in R&D, which is on a downward spiral. Other BRICS countries, particularly China and India, have been consistently investing in R&D. And you can see from the areas in which, um, they are, for instance, solar on solar, the manufacturing or development of solar. China, we understand that it's, it's number one in terms of the production of, or manufacturing of solar. India is number four. And they're doing well because they have consistently been investing strategically in various areas of, uh, of science. We too as well, we do have our own areas of, uh, of scientific strengths and, and capabilities. That's why we're having the square kilometer array. We were able to manufacture almost 20,000 ventilators. We are in a process of developing the vaccine and manufacturing capabilities. There are other capabilities um, that we can still develop provided we are able as, as the, the entire system, you know, the public, the private, the civil society, to continuously invest in R&D. But most importantly, we need to make sure that ordinary people, they see value, they see impact in, in the investments that are being made in the STI. And, and this should be our focus for the next 10 to 20 years to improve the impact. No, absolutely. And then with um, events such as this, I mean, what do you think its efficacy is in bringing awareness, educating, empowering people, perhaps even laying that seed forward for what um, you're trying to achieve at launch? Look, look, the mere fact that it's happening here in Africa, we can't underestimate the power of this event because it's sending firstly a positive image to international community that Africa as well can, can really stand uh, its, you know, its ground in terms of scientific development and capabilities. So that positive message about Africa standing or modernity is important. Secondly, we're bringing international partners here, some of them beyond this forum 
they will also be exploring what South Africa uh, has and the opportunities that exist um, here in South Africa to build better relationships and partnerships with other countries. But we're also having African countries, other African countries who are here. We hope that uh, through this science forum as well, there could be better opportunities in which uh, uh, South Africa, in partnership with our international partners, we could also work uh, with our SADC and, and continental colleagues to build the necessary scientific and technological capabilities in Africa. We need to build a very strong African technological capability. And key to that, in our view, is to set up an Africa-wide research and innovation fund so that, as the minister said, we reduce dependence on foreign donors, who, by the way, will shape and, and constrain our abilities as, as Africans to shape our research agenda. So we need to liberate ourselves by creating this platform, which will really play a significant, and I hope people who are here will take this message um, uh, to, to other structures, including AU. So it's about restoring agency at large for the continent. But Absolutely. I dare ask you about timelines, but I know that's going to be part of the discussions that's yeah. going to um, happen as the days progress. Yeah. But thank you for your time with us on the ACBC at this hour. Thank Dr. Mnungi Sikele is the CEO of the National Advisory Council on Innovation. He's here at the Science um, Forum at South Africa 2023, unpacking from a BRICS STI policy symposium point of view. Those discussions are obviously also get underway. But to take the session even further, I'm going to bring in Dr. Pulani Kusaletsi Msuela. She is um, the Secretary General of the Botswana Academy of Science, joining us to unpack a little bit further the relationship between indigenous knowledge systems and science and how the two can in fact find um, intersections and collaboration. So Dr. Pulani, good afternoon and thanks for your time with us here on the SABC at this hour. Perhaps as we look at the role of traditional healthcare practitioners and, you know, what, what they do the role that they've played, even in a post-COVID scenario, what, what's been observed on that front before we look at the intersections? All right, thank you very much for having me. Um, and I must say that the perspective that I'm going to give you is from a session that we held yes. on the sidelines of um, today's event. And at this session, we had panelists, Bogogo, Bomkulu, Dinga Gazastwana, and we had researchers and policy makers. So during that panel, what we're trying to do was to look at indigenous knowledge systems, right? Specifically our traditional health practitioners and their role in mental health to try and bridge the gap. And this was organized by the Academies of Science for Botswana, Lesotho, Eswatini, and South Africa. So during this, um, it was quite evident that traditional health practices have been there. It's an age-old practice, especially in Africa. Now, the issue here is it was overtaken by Western medicine, right? Because, um, as I said, I'm echoing the presenters. One yes. of them mentioned our practices, traditional health practices, have been demonized. They have been marginalized. They have not been given an equal platform to grow, and yet they're effective, right? Um, we had them give examples. There was a herbalist from Lesotho. They, during the COVID period, developed medicine that went on to clinical trials, I mean to laboratory trials, and this medicine was found to work quite well. Unfortunately, because of funding, they couldn't take it further. We also had a lot of them mention that a lot of people present with mental health disorders, about 80% of them who come to consult um, traditional health practitioners. Um, therefore, they have ways of dealing with this. We also had one who said, bring me someone who has mental health issues, like who's presenting with these symptoms, and I will cure them. But the issue is, um, in terms of our policy, right, we have not integrated this. So, for example, the traditional healer who says they can um, cure mental health uh, problems, they say, but if you take this person to the hospital and you have them injected or sedated, then now I can't work well because some of these things are spiritual, right? So they um, have been there for a long time and do work. So you're speaking about managing perceptions and recreating the perceptions around indigenous knowledge systems and even traditional um, healthcare practitioners. Metaphorically speaking, the bird flies because it has two wings and there's science on the one end, the one wing, and religion or 
spirituality, indigenous knowledge systems on the other, if we're going to group it in that sense. How can this bird take off? How do we find intersections between both so that the bird can fly? Exactly. Now our bird is now flying with one wing, right? The science is being listened to, which is right. So this session again, what we wanted to do is let's bridge this gap. Let's also enhance and capacitate the other wing, right? The traditional practices, which could be um, using plants, animals, and spirituality. And policy is what we're looking at. Policy can help um, bridge this gap, right? So um, the way our policy um, traditionally would be formulated is that it is not transformative, right? Now we want a policy that will involve all the stakeholders as we were doing in the panel discussion, have them all at the table and say, how do we tackle this? How do we include this? We need for there to be inclusivity of both sectors and for them to work together for this bird to fly off. And in terms of gaps that still exist, just as we conclude, you've spoken about legislature, you've spoken about policies. What about the platforms available for such? Yes, platforms, again, also um, are, are developing, right? For the longest time, they really were not there. Uh, people will go to uh, consult only when it's dark, right? People won't have a conversation that, oh, no, I went to consult and this is what is happening. But now we've seen globally the World Health Organization, we've seen continentally the African Union, we've seen SADC, and we've seen individual countries saying, we acknowledge that there's traditional health practices, and we acknowledge that they are being used and they work, but we need to create a space where um, we can have a conversation to make sure that these are regulated. So we've seen this emerging in all the four countries, Lesotho, Botswana, Eswatini, and, and, and um, South Africa. They, these have been acknowledged and the associations and the representatives of these associations were the ones who were at the panel discussion. So we do have that happening. Um, and I must point out South Africa as an example because uh, it has created a space within the ministry that deals with health where um, it's particularly dealing with traditional health practices to make sure that they are regulated, they are included, and they are also monitored because the issue usually is, am I not too much? How much should I take? Am I not going to be poisoned? So those are happening within the SADC region and such conversations though we still need to have them to make sure that our policy is reactive to this and inclusive of this. So it seems that strides have been taken and we acknowledge that. We're obviously measuring from where and to as we look at the next level for these conversations and the plans that will follow. Thank you for your time with us on the ACBC at this hour. Dr. Polani Kusaletse um, Mswela is the Secretary General of Botswana's Academy of Science weighing in on some of the discussions that have been happening on the sidelines. Um, obviously, the Science Forum South Africa 2023 will see over 60 of those plenaries, debates, discussions happening between the 6th and the 8th of December. We're looking at the role of science in South Africa on the continent and globally and uh, really wait to from here as we merge some of those um, indigenous knowledge systems with science. Again, as I mentioned earlier on, there are exhibitions underway. It's an open public science event, so the public is welcomed um, to obviously participate and interact with the various exhibitors, um, government, civil society, and the industry at large who've come out to be part of the various stakeholders present here today. So for now, I'm going to hand it back to you in studio.